Now we come to a kind of a tutti, which is this thing with strings and horns. Body, the horn trio, strings, double notes and cellos and basses. Welcome to Live Action Star Wars. I'm Ralph. I'm James. And today we are talking about Star Wars, music by John Williams. It's like a BBC documentary from 1980. Yeah, and right from the get-go, the version of it that we watched, that hopefully you watched as well, you can tell that it's from 1980. Yeah, um, it's the, the version the version that we put up on our YouTube channel. So if yeah. you haven't watched the documentary, if you like John Williams, uh, watch it. It's good. Mm. And... Um, some skippable parts so it's like about an hour long but there was lengthy scenes of not star wars stuff um even though some, i found interesting some i'm though. familiar with yeah some yeah. i'm familiar with um like superman and stuff but some of the other ones i wasn't familiar with and it made me want to go get those scores his early um, work i'm guessing like yeah, his yeah. his 1960s the stuff that he started in where it's like a lot of comedies and things like that the audrey hepburn yeah. uh what was it to steal a million or something mm -hmm. um Things like that. Yeah, I'd, I'd not heard any of those things. I um, have a few of his early works. Early works. I have like the Fury and I have Valley of the Dolls and yeah. Fury. Did I say Fury twice? You said Fury twice. Do you yeah, have it I twice? Have Do you it. own it twice? No, I just have the once. Okay. Uh, but like Poseidon Adventure and Towering Inferno. Poseidon Adventure score I love. Mm. I love. Um, this documentary is great because... It takes place right, just right at the height of John Williams. Like he yeah. did Jaws, Close Encounters, and Star Wars. And so now it's like, okay. Well, they talk about it. They switch to talking about his collaborations with Spielberg in right. this documentary. And at this point, he's just done three. It was right. it was Jaws, Close Encounters, and... Star uh, Wars. No, with Spielberg, the third one. Oh, 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 oh. Probably 1941. At that point, I'm, I don't know. Yeah, it must have been, but I don't think maybe they don't mention it. But they, the, they talk um, about close encounters quite a lot. Um, right. it's interesting hearing them I love talk that about that. It's an amazing score, came out the same year as Star Wars. Nuts. Yeah, well, they had um, their bet, didn't they, Lucas and Spielberg, about yeah. which was going to be. But what's great about this is at the time, the only Star Wars music we had was the original, mm -hmm. and so like in the last 44 years we've kind of taken for granted like john williams music like we know it's always going to be there yeah. we know it's always going to be great and we love it but going back and watching this and being set in 1980 and seeing how at the time these kinds of scores didn't exist and john no. williams kind of brought it back um so so it makes you appreciate it even more because it's like Oh, at this point in time, it couldn't have been, it, you know, there's a chance it couldn't have been like this, but mm. it is. And we all like benefited greatly from it. So much. It wasn't uh, it, uh, the, the, the in thing in movies around sort of the time leading up to Jaws really was sort of either jazz scores or uh, sort of soundtrack, like fully soundtracks. So you'd have people like Queen doing the soundtrack for things like that, which, okay, that happened later in the eighties, but <laughs> the same sort of situation would happen more often right. um or the jazziness but yeah one having a, sort of a full things, classical orchestral score came back one of my favorite things to sort of explain the impact of star wars is star wars came out in 1976 there's a movie that i absolutely love that came out in or it came out in 77 there's a movie i love that came out in 76 yeah i got the shirt on it's <laughs> i got the year wrong um there's a movie that came out in 76 that i absolutely love and it's insane that it came out just a year before Star Wars. And that's Logan's Run. Oh, um, yeah. I don't know if you've seen Logan's Run. A long time ago. But if anybody hasn't seen Logan's Run, um, it's a great movie. But it looks so fucking dated. It is yeah. nuts. I'm going to put some shit down here just so you can see what Logan's Run looks like. And The like, difference 
between Logan's Run yeah. and Star Wars is you'd think 20, 30 years, like right. not, not a matter of months. But if you get a chance there, the score to Logan's run is phenomenal. Uh, um, it's, it's Jerry Goldsmith. Okay. And uh, I don't, I, I, I just look it up. Yeah. Uh, but the, if you have like Apple one or something like that, um, download the soundtrack. Mm. It's so electronic. It's so 1976. It's the most bizarre score ever. But what I love about that score is, um, if you know the story of Logan, he lives in a dome city of the future. Yeah. And he runs away from it, uh, fleeing for his life. And he's being hunted down by, you know, the state. Um, the farther he gets away from that dome, that electronic music slowly turns into orchestral. Oh, that's very and, cool. Um, and it, it makes me so happy. It feels like it's transition mm. from 70s, like sci-fi into what Star Wars becomes. What you it becomes think about... The movie becomes more gritty as it goes on. Yeah. And the like the opening scenes look like it takes place in a abandoned shopping mall. Yeah. It's really, really, really so yeah. I mean you think about you think about um THX eleven thirty eight as well. That was a very sort of electronic score as well. Right. Um where I mean, it was, Yeah. It, it was it was Lucas's first film. Um I mean having a soundtrack for American Graffiti makes sense because of the type of movie it is. Um, mm. But yeah, the score for THX was so vastly different and it wasn't until he got to Star Wars and ha- his buddy, Steven Spielberg, had worked with John Williams on Jaws that he'd recommended that they check him out and it fit the tone. They, they knew what they wanted. And yeah, that's when we get the amazing scores that we are now. It's just, it's just, music is when you think movie music i think generally even still to this day like okay there are other big names that people might recognize but when you talk to anyone who's not maybe into film like we are if you say movie music they're probably gonna think of john williams more than anything else right uh it's the most sort of broad spectrum and like they've everyone has seen a john williams picture yeah, and it's funny because we think of John Williams as, you know, Superman, Raider, Star Wars, all these, like, E.T., all yeah. these things from our childhood, but you forget, like, there's a whole other generation that, like, Harry Potter. The, the Harry Potter. <laughs> and, like, I, I worked did, at I think, theme the park. first two or first three. I don't I, I worked but, at a theme park in the mid-2000s, uh, like, a, quite a, a theme park for sort of small kids, and yeah. I, whenever I was assigned to a, a particular ride, they had the first Harry Potter soundtrack just on a loop. So, oh my God, I heard it to death yeah. and it, it drove me nuts because I just don't care. I've never cared about Harry Potter. <laughs> um, right. But I could still appreciate, you know, it's great music. It's like there is a hook there. There is themes. There is all these things that John Williams does better than anyone else to this day still to better than anyone else. Right. Um, I remember when uh, was The Force Awakens was coming out and everyone like the first initial reactions and reviews were coming. And people were sort of saying, it's like, yeah, there's this, there's this. I don't really think that there's the the hook, the theme, like the Imperial March or the uh, the Luke theme or anything like that. And I saw it like opening day and I was instantly, I was like, bullshit, race theme, is that for that film right. for me? Um, and also like Kylo Ren's theme we've got in there. But that Ray theme, the, the do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do, do which... Mm-hmm. I still stand by JJ had a hand in and played him uh, Flute Loop by the Beastie Boys because it's <laughs> it's so, so close to Flute Loop by the Beastie Boys. Um, but it's it's there and it is such a hook and the way that builds, it's it's classic John Williams. You love it. Yeah. But with this going back to this documentary, as you said, at the point that this comes out, we've only got Star Wars. We don't have Empire Strikes Back. So seeing some of the behind the scenes where he's he's watching the the sort of the rough cut basically of say the carbon freeze chamber and we're yeah. getting him you could sort of see his mind working he's coming up it's, with it's, the the Han and Leia it's love a reaction theme video. Like, exactly it is a react <laughs> it's it's a really early version of a react and it's like yeah but it's the it's a react video but for a musical genius who can watch that and go right what am i going to do with that i can go there when okay oh, what what's the time code of this okay cool when this comes in his, i need to build it his smile 
his smile when when Han says I I know, I know. like it is so good. You could just see it in his face where he's like, that's perfect. And he looks over that to is... what to what Gary Kurtz or Ivan Kirshner or something, and it's yeah. just like he looks over and he's like, that's good. And yeah, they're like, yeah, we know, <laughs> we were there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it it uh watching those early the the early versions of those scenes and hearing not only um david prowse mm. which we're all used to mm -hmm. but then hearing peter mayhew yelling making chewy noises yeah mm. oh so and good. even like layers so layers definitely been adr'd because she her delivery of it sounds different like just the tone of her voice and everything maybe it's pitched up or down or something um yeah. by presumably by ben burt but like hearing her the raw audio of her saying i love you yeah it, it does sound different i think harrison's i know still sounds pretty clean like it's pretty similar i don't think there was much done to that but her right. delivery it wouldn't surprise me if that had been 80 yard well yeah i mean the the noise in that room yeah was insane you could barely hear anybody talking yeah that's it it sounded like they were shooting it in a factory Can we i want to talk about ben burt for a little bit yes um the the antagonist of this documentary <laughs> right and william <laughs> just said it he's he he doesn't get to see the movie with the sound effects and so it, it he, he brings up the sound effects being like the enemy of uh film composers cool. yeah and then they cut to ben burt <laughs> which we'll get to in a second but the thing i love about this documentary is that by the time we would get to from star wars to jedi the making of a saga mm. you have ben burt and John Williams sitting in the stage together, yeah, working out Ewok songs, and they're working together. It's almost yeah. like, why are we fighting each other? <laughs> you can tell that there's never, there's never really any actual animosity. They are friends. No. Like they say early on, like that his friends refer to him as Johnny Williams, and the yeah. first thing that comes out of Ben Burt's mouth is talking about Johnny, and it's just like, yeah, yeah of course they they work hand in hand, but the way that it's the way that John Williams presents it as, you know, they are like, like a, a, an actor, an actor wouldn't want their dialogue being covered up by sound. Uh, same goes for the music. Same goes for the sound effects. They're both mm -hmm. want their, their stuff to be noticed, but they're playing at the same time. So yeah. I liked, I like this documentary is juxtaposed to the, the from Star Wars to Jedi where they're sitting there listening to the music because yep. Ben Bird's coming up with sounds. John Williams is coming up with the music and they're, they're talking, they're discussing what are you going to do here mm. as opposed to, I don't know what they're going to be playing. So I'm just going to just do what I do. I guess I'll and, do my side of it and it's happening at the same time, but in just like yeah. different locations. Yeah. Yeah. But what's great is that... I mean, at this point, they don't have the ranch, do they? They're not doing this out of Skywalker Ranch. This is still no. on 20th Century Fox sort of studio buildings. Yeah. So they are working separately. What I what I love, though, is that they talk about... Ben Burt's talking about how he constructed the hyperdrive failing. Yeah. Which I did not realize was composed of like five different things. And then yeah, it's, the it's one of those things. You know, you know about the the plane engine. Everyone knows, and, and you hear it, and you're like, yeah. "That's it. That's the sound." But mm -hmm. then he puts the other thing in, and you're like, "Oh yeah, I guess that's in there too." But what's great is that John Williams' score for that moment when the hyperdrive fails, and the sound effect that Ben Burt picked for the hyperdrive failing, line up so perfectly. Mm -hmm. They both sort of just peter out like it's, it's one like the sound it's, effect yeah. peters out and the music sort of peters out yeah and it's i don't know how they did that shit because they're editing analog they're editing yeah. film in like a hand crank thing you should, like you, i don't i mean you we see him later on taking notes of like time codes like very very specific time codes yeah and it's gotta be just done on that because there's no other way that you're going to be able to match it up so precisely it's and nuts. i think I think that is also the key and why Ben Burt is such a special person because he was the film editor and he was in charge of sound. It's, yeah. it's a rare combination that I think lends itself. So he can basically, he can picture lock the, the edit so that right. like John Williams can compose and he can do all the sound like perfectly. There's no more tinkering with the edit 
And if there is, it's him that's doing that. So he can be in charge. It's basically, it's removing however many people in that line. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, it's uh, it, just watching, watching that spotting session where he, Williams is telling the editor where the music drops in and yeah. he's like that stuff. Like it makes me like wonder how any movie even got made back then. It's nuts. It's um, so impressive. And the, the turnaround <laughs> time as well. Like everyone knows about right. how quickly turnaround times happen. Um, I think Rogue One was like a, ridiculously fast wasn't it you you're gonna know much better than i am um um yeah uh Giacchino had four four weeks to write and yeah. then i don't know how much that was just to to write it yeah um and i don't know i don't know how much time he had to record but his recording sessions usually go about 10 days which yeah. i think they said in this one this one i think it was nine i think for this or something yeah but so yeah. Yeah, yeah, still, it's, it's, it's a quick turnaround, yeah. and it's the fact that all of this is happening, and he, I mean, Williams sort of says it. He's like, yeah, you know, due to budgets and time constraints and theater availability and things like that. It's like to think that that would have been a concern for <laughs> Star Wars is he's insane. It's he's, like now everything gets dropped. If there's a Star Wars coming out, everything else is getting dropped. Um, yeah, and he said, he said, hey, do you want it? Do you want it done well, or do you want it tomorrow? <laughs> and like, I mean, I've I, I've heard that amongst a lot of things with production, yeah. not just the score. It's like, like which do you yeah. want? Uh, we can do it good, or we can do it now. Like which? Do you right. Want? And then they they mentioned the budget of Star Wars or Empire Strikes Back being eighteen million and rising and climbing. I'm yeah. Like, I'm like, oh my god. Yeah. Like, nineteen eighty money. And if if you made a Star Wars movie for eighteen million today, first of all, film. Would, if you made an indie film for eighteen million, dollars, yeah, I would love to see it. Um, and you would make a huge, you uh, make a make your money back and like, yeah, tenfold. Yeah. Um, yeah. do it. Let's get let's get a let's get an eighteen million dollar Star Wars film, a whole film. A <laughs> okay. Because I'm, I'm I'm listen. I love the Disney era. I like the prequels and I love the original trilogy, but I feel mm -hmm. like, and I've said this before with Solo. And with um, Rogue One, mm. where we all know about the sort of um, problems that they had, yeah, with the production, um, but I feel like it brings the energy to the movie. Mm. So I don't keeping it faster, more intense. Yeah, yeah. And with with like Ryan Johnson, where they said that you know they didn't have any issues with him. It sounds like Force Awakens went off without a hitch. Uh, maybe there were some issues with. Well, they did have issues with uh, Rise of Skywalker. Um, I mean, my, right, um, Force Awakens did like building up to production. Like they lost uh, Michael Arndt as a writer and things like that. There was mm -hmm. there was some struggles. It wasn't yeah. completely smooth. But I feel like but once feel they like, got into production, it was fine. But I feel like the ones that have the problems, your Solo, Rogue One, and Rise of Skywalker, mm -hmm. are the ones I gravitate to the most. They have an energy to them. They have a. They just have this energy, and I would love to see a filmmaker like don't have don't have Lucasfilm sort of butt in too much. Mm. Just get a filmmaker that's really good that you really trust, like a James Gunn. Let's say James Gunn. I like James Gunn. He has a lot of energy behind his movies. Just give him eighteen million, and say do whatever you want yeah. with this eighteen million to make a Star Wars. Yeah, and I guarantee you that film is going to have so much guts, and it's going to have like it's just gonna feel like like the Was most it, fun production ever it'd be really interesting to see what you'd get with it now because yeah, yeah i mean I'm, 18 million dollars like we've got we're, we're ramping up to book above affair at the moment and the the production of that is definitely going to have cost more than 18 million dollars <laughs> right, I, th right i feel like every episode is going to be like close to 10 so it's it's like it probably cost 18 million to create the void if not more or oh the, yeah, the I would volume, think so. The yeah, the volume. Or, yeah, um, but I just feel like I want, like, I, I come back to to the Last Jedi because I feel like they put in a lot of money towards it and they didn't have any issues, um, and they just left so much in mm. as they were. They were, everything was going smoothly. They they shot the script as it was, 
and they just edited some of it out but it's like well we put the money into it and it went smoothly and everything so looks good and we'll just make it an hour or two and a half hours um whereas opposed to rogue one where it's like let's scramble and get yeah. this thing good and 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 get what we can and it just and it's funny because energy. um what's his name who made rogue um uh, gareth edwards gareth edwards yeah have you seen uh monsters his first film yeah i've seen yeah i loved it yeah it's great and that is made for a shoestring budget that's made for nothing basically yeah. um and it works because of that i feel like you put i mean i didn't see the the director dvd sequel that was made but i feel like that had a higher budget and was like what's the point like, it loses met, all of its magic i met i met gareth at a party once mm. and he was being hounded i could tell he was like being cornered by two nerds yeah not that i say i'm not saying we are in our they were just you could tell and they were just just you could just tell they wanted something from him and i don't know what like mm. it, it felt like they were talking about star wars they were talking about themselves a lot yeah and i saw this and Ooh. so i i actually ducked into the conversation and started talking to him and they kind of walked away so i'm like i'm here to rescue you <laughs> <laughs> who are you i'm ralph apple i'm friends with <laughs> and you're a little short for a podcaster <laughs> um the uh so I started talking to him, talking to him about him. I told him, I said, "Hey, man, uh, I, I had my um, Hadora, my Godzilla Hadora pin on. Mm -hmm. I, my, uh, I got my Hadora pin on. I love, I loved your Godzilla, but I really mm -hmm. loved Monsters, which, which was great." And he said, "Oh, thanks," which then turned into a conversation about 1977 Star Wars that lasted about an hour. Great. Um, we, it was, it was awesome because I didn't he didn't want to talk about rogue one to no. these guys he is a fan of star wars and he As loves 77 star wars and so i like it's what brought us all to the dance it's what, it's yeah, what got us all yeah. there like that's what everyone's always going to want to talk about so like i like the way he he did star wars mm. um like monsters the movie mm. monsters everything is handheld yep everything feels on the fly mm -hmm. i feel like the art direction in that movie is my favorite of i love it any of any of the the disney era i know yeah. everyone says that um the last shot jedi is the most beautiful star wars ever i think rogue one is there's something about the way they created a realistic environment yeah and when they had to make it realistic every angle yeah because gareth was going to go in there with his camera on his shoulder and, and go not, shoot within the environment. Yeah, that's um, it. Not with necessarily like blocking as planned. It's like, right, here's what I've right. got. I will block based on what I've got. Yeah. Right. The the thing that drives me nuts about Last Jedi, and I know we'll we'll get to that episode eventually. Yeah. But um, they're in this high speed chase. It's a battle in in space, and everything is dire. Mm. But everybody is presented in a very like it's a play. Mm. every shot is set up so perfectly the camera doesn't move at all so it seems very feels very safe mm. and the sets because of that feel like sets um yeah. and and there's something about rogue one and the energy of rogue one where it's like no we created an environment and here comes gareth with his camera yeah so i i i prefer that kind of style and if you haven't seen monsters Check oh, it go out. watch Monsters. It's um, what it was, 90 minutes tops. It's I think it's like 85 minutes long. Right. It's nothing. It was made by him, like and pretty much only him. <laughs> yeah. He did yeah. everything, like all the visual effects, the effects for himself. He shot His it. brother um, did the score, I believe. That I don't know. I think so. Or a family member. Or maybe it, yeah, <laughs> something like that. I know that it was done basically just by like a family or a friend or something yeah. like that, where it's like it's all done super it's, cheap. It's him and two actors going yeah. into like a hurricane ridden South America and shooting this story where you follow these two characters it's through a road this movie. environment. Yeah. But they're saying that it was monsters that did this, like kaiju yeah. monsters. Yeah. Um, great movie. Uh, uh, but yeah, I don't know what he's up to. Um, I'd like him to do another Star Wars. Something. Love to. Yeah, I'd love I it. Mean, I mean, I don't know how what his relationship was like with um yeah the way that it Lucasfilm. ended anyway i don't know yeah. if he even would want to do another star wars i mean 
he he got he got a crack at it and it mm. was a success people love it um yeah. it did well at the box office um, i feel like it's one that people come back to and seem to like more and more and they will talk yeah. more positively about even if they didn't really love it at first or didn't yeah. really know what to expect for it i feel like it has the effect of empire yeah i feel like empire because when i was a kid empire was not my favorite mm. Um, I didn't really care for it because it was it was just you know mm. there's no Death Star ending there's no big the like Luke Triumph Skywalker loses moment. I don't like I don't like Luke Skywalker losing that sucks but growing up you realize it does suck that Luke gets beat but yeah. that's, that's what makes you makes you like Luke more <laughs> that's <laughs> like, why like, that's what makes Luke in Return of the Jedi so great is that you yeah. know he got his ass handed to him. So this documentary was released mm. just days before Empire I was, came out. I was going to ask when exactly it is because in the in the narration it says it'll hit cinemas on Tuesday. Like <laughs> this documentary okay. came out. Yeah. So this like, was May eighteenth, May eighteenth in uh, nineteen eighty in the UK. Um, and I three days. And I, oh, I don't know. I, mean, I don't know when it was released in. Let me look. It was because... released on the twenty first of May in the United States. I'm so, sure that we didn't get it at the same time because we, until like the Disney era, so we didn't get not? anything. Uh, we didn't get anything. We didn't get episode one until, I want to say, August of 99. That, that makes no sense. It's bad. Um, I I had to have um, a pirate VHS guys, of episode one to see it first. But you guys get the uh, the James Bond movies before we do. We get a lot of things before you guys do now. Yeah. All right, um, all right James. Yeah. What? Spoiler? <laughs> It's been it's been too much. Okay, we're we're past. The, the, okay, um, so yeah, according to my VHS box set, it came out May twenty first, nineteen eighty, in the United States. Yeah. Uh, wow. So the box office it. gross, and I'm assuming this is just domestic, is two hundred and twenty three million. Okay. So it made over two hundred million than the production cost. That is um, what I would call a success. Uh, May twenty first, nineteen eighty, in the UK as well. Awesome, a global release. Wait, yeah, look at that. Impressive. So, well, yeah, came out not at all. Days. When you look at the rest of the world, definitely not a global release. Oh, so okay. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, Soviet Union, who didn't get as it until as... July July fourteenth, nineteen ninety. As far as live action Star Wars goes, it's a global release. I don't know. It's pretty pretty global. Uh, yeah, Bulgaria and Poland didn't get it until like nineteen eighty four and nineteen eighty three. So. Holy shit. Yeah. That's a long time. Yeah, Soviet Union, not until 1990. The Iron Curtain was real. <laughs> they, oh, really, crazy. they really didn't want them to see as that was. Um, back to this documentary, uh, though. Yeah. It came out days before. Yeah. They spoil a lot in this documentary. I mean, just the I love you, I know, is right up front Huge. in like the first 10 minutes. I, I noticed it by the end, though. They only stay with the Han and Leia storyline. We don't get anything of Luke. We no. don't get. We get like a snippet Yoda. of Vader. Uh, no, no Yoda mention whatsoever. So it's almost like they'd said, "Okay, for this side of the press material, we can tell you about the Han and Leia storyline. You can use that yeah. stuff if you want to basically show off some scenes. Here's some scenes that we can show off. We um, we mentioned in the in the, our previous episode that on the poster we see Han and Leia kissing. So it's like, I, I feel like, and that's, it's right there from the start of the film, the, the mm. tension between the two of them. Um, so that's fine. But yeah, the, the, I love you. I know is right there and we see it multiple times. Yeah. Um, and even there's a, a bit earlier than that in the documentary where they talk about Lando and the, the how, Oh, and this is the moment where we start to see that actually Lando is a goodie. Um, and I love that he says is a goodie. I think that's just really wholesome of John Williams. Um, <laughs> But it's like, I feel like in the press material, the way I've otherwise understood it is like, we're led to believe that he is a good guy joining the cast. And then his betrayal, quote unquote, yeah. is what is the surprise. And then the redemption sort of comes 10, 15 minutes later. Um, but it's interesting that they all of this stuff comes out. And then the, at the end of the documentary, it, it basically ends by showing most of a scene. We get the full scene of the, the Minuck hunt and then... Han shooting. It's, my it's, great. it's my favorite part of this documentary. The the music. <laughs> what the scene the music from the movie? The, 
Yeah. Well, in this in this in this documentary, mm-hmm. um, before we get to the Minox scene, we hear him playing something on the piano. Yeah. And it's definitely that music from the Minox scene. Yeah. The dun 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 dun. dun it's the dun, slow dun, build of it as well. Like. Do, 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 do. Oh. Yeah. I, a, I love that music. It's, it's great. It's, it's so one good. of my favorite pieces in Empire. Um, it and it's so good because it's like a theme for the Minoc. Yeah. That you know if if it's in if they put when they put when they put yeah. Minox in one of these Felony shows. Yeah. It's uh, Kevin Kiner or whoever will put in the music from this scene in it. Um, it's it's such a weird it's such a weird theme. Like the, there was a while where I was obsessed with that theme. And I listened to that track like five times in a row. It complements because it sort of it feels it's got the same sort of energy to the asteroid chase, Um, but it's it is different. It's it's not the same flow, but it's yeah. It feels like it's sort of I don't know that entire section of the movie where they are in the asteroid. Um, Yeah, it's great. I love it. the The best part is that John Williams likes it because after he plays it on the piano, which gave me chills i thought Hearing oh my god him. this is the inception yeah. of this thing that i Just really like twiddling with the keys and coming up with it yeah. yeah so good but to hear him sort of rehearse with the orchestra and yeah. they start playing it and he puts his baton down and he's just laughing because he just is enjoying it so much yeah. and and being able to hear it from inception to rehearsal to final product it's like it's got to give the composer so much joy. Like he said, he likes playing music. Yeah. There's a whole section where he sort of is. Yeah. He says like, I I'd like to play as much as I can because I feel like it makes me a better composer. And I don't think like, which I get mentions that he doesn't like composing as much because, or um, conducting as much because it's other people playing the sounds, making the music. But what's great is, is that moment when they do you play the, the Minoc theme, he still has so much joy for the music that he created. Yeah. And he just is laughing. And I'm like, oh yeah. my gosh, it's so weird. I don't think I've ever seen John Williams laugh before. It's the smile. It's the laugh. Yeah. You always sort of see him because most of the time when we see him, we were seeing shots of him conducting where he's yeah. stone faced. He's serious. Or interviews where he's just being serious and telling exactly. him like, music shit. But he's like, the dude is jovial as a little hell like he's so much yeah. fun he's enjoying he's loving the music and it's great I, to see I it i love i believe it's in it's in the i believe it's called the skywalker saga mm-hmm. um which is the documentary about sort of the making of the rise of skywalker but also the 44 years of star wars um history and stuff where they get like archival interviews that i've like some reason never seen before mixed with like new stuff but there's a they get to john williams and shit this might be its own documentary i think that i think on apple on itunes they have an exclusive documentary about john williams it's maybe like 20 minutes long um i'll put that i'll pop that on the list we'll we'll definitely get to it but there's a scene in that where they're doing the recording session for rise of skywalker Mm -hmm. and like jj's there but then like i want to say mark hamill might be there but daisy ridley's definitely there um and john williams is in love with daisy ridley he talks about her he doesn't want anybody else to to write music for her character oh wow um, he just loves her so much so in the documentary or in that in that bit in the documentary when williams is done he goes over and gives Daisy Ridley a big hug, Mm. turns to his assistant who then hands him sheet music. And it's the original handwritten race theme. Amazing. He signs it and he gives it to her and she just starts falling. And I just like the most, it it just, I, I, I remember that. I've like, it's so funny how, how this old man, cause he was an old man when I was a kid. Yeah. He's always felt like an old guy. Yeah. He's still touching people. Like his, yeah. his music is still touching people. I was um, four years old. I don't know if I've talked about this on the show before. I was four years old. I was not allowed to see um, Raiders of the Lost Ark. Mm-hmm. So um, my mom thought it was too violent. So she bought me this. And I, I, I've, I've brought it up so many times. I don't know if I brought it up on the show. 
um, but through um, a mailway service, she got me this. It's a video uh, or an audio cassette of yep. the 1981 Lucasfilm production of Raiders of the Lost Ark. Love it. And I've had this tape since I was four. Oh, and wow. this is what got me into film music. And oh, wow. uh, I, I love John Williams. I, I listened to this tape and would draw pictures of Indiana Jones. But it's it's this this stupid hunk of plastic with with this tape inside. Um, Does like it still play? completely opened my eyes to like this whole other thing that I didn't know existed. Mm -hmm. And um, man, I just love John Williams. So as soon as I saw this documentary existed, I'm like, I need to, I need to watch it. So um, good. And so, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't have like a whole bunch to say about it. Um, it there's nothing really new in it that we can discuss. I mean, of course, there is the mini rig thing that we I've been calling a mini rig. Yeah. But that little sled cannon that we saw it's right again, at the beginning. Again, I watched it again. And when Still it popped, I got it. so excited. Yeah. I got so it, excited. It feels um, so different. And especially like, as I said, most of this documentary, when we see stuff from Star Wars, it's the the asteroid chase. It's Han and Leia on the Falcon. Um, right. But we see a little bit of the Hoth stuff to begin with. And that's when we see it. And they're talking about the production and how it had to be real yeah. snow and basically showing the scope of what making a Star Wars movie is like, especially the second Star Wars movie. They, I mean, they, they refer to it as Star Wars 2, The Empire Strikes Back. Um, yeah. And <laughs> that is kind of what it's like. And yeah, seeing that, that mini rig again, it's cool. And yeah. the video, if you've not seen it, where we talk in depth about it or it comes up more, my first reactions for it is right there. Yeah, um, I, I don't, I don't have much more to say about the documentary. I could probably talk about John Williams forever. Yeah, um, I, I thought it was interesting that uh, George Lucas kind of was sidelined for a, a lot of this documentary. They refer to him as a writer. Um, they do mention that he was the creator of the property and directed yeah. the first film, but like when we first see him, um, we see him or he's he's mentioned just as a writer and then the focus is on right. gary kurtz the producer and irvin kershner the director of this one i can't My, see uh, i can't see or hear irvin kershner without thinking of matt what's his, yeah matt gorley's impression of irvin kershner because it's so perfect the uh why um the uh <laughs> I, i'm assuming george lucas was kind of busy i think so a little too busy to do the documentary and we get so. a lot of Williams after. So yeah. it's not a big, is that, was that Star Tours? Was, is, are they recording <laughs> Star Tours? No, it's, it's probably a recording is in progress. Um, uh, it um, wasn't, it was, but, a, it was a, a device made by Amazon. Oh. I'm not oh. going to say it because she'll start talking back to me. Did, did you say something that sounded like that? Uh, apparently. Wow. That's cool. Um, <laughs> let us know if your uh, hmm says went off. <laughs> um, but okay. So anyway, John Williams, love the dude. Mm -hmm. um, I, 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 I just, I, I, I can't, there's not much more I could say about it. If you want to hear me like talk about all these themes, Film from Star Wars, just, just um, yeah. Pop over to my Patreon. It's a, it's a buck. Um, I, I did. I covered the music of all uh, eleven Star Wars films, including mm -hmm. the uh, the nine that uh, Williams did. Um, and on my Patreon, it's called Lightsabers and Light Motifs. There's a link at the top on my Patreon page. Um, if you don't want to pay the money, the first one is available for free. You can kind of get a, a glimpse of what that is. Um, I also recommend a friend of the show, uh, Chrysanthi Tan. Yes. Um, she did one of my Mandalorian episodes, which is also on Patreon. Um, but she does a whole show just about Star Wars music. And yeah, if that's you want, Star if you Wars. want someone who can make music and can speak a lot more in an educated fashion about music, uh, Chris right. is the person to listen to. Right, and that's here at uh, Star Wars Minute Music. Music Star Wars Star Wars yeah. Music Minute. Star Wars Music Minute. Got mm -hmm. it. A uh, spinoff of the was, Great Star Wars Minute. Yeah, and I was an, I was a guest on her um, one of her episodes. Uh, I would say listen to the audio version. 
because in the video version, for some reason, my video got delayed and I'm like out of sync with my oh, voice. No. And it, it, I know I was so bummed because I was so excited to be on the show. Yeah. Because I, I can talk about Star Wars music forever. And I, I did. And I can't watch it because I'm so out of sync. Uh, before we wrap up, out. I just want to talk about the, the BBC of it all. Because this, this is the <laughs> okay. sort of BBC documentary that would have been videotaped and shown in schools to us like we we grew up watching this sort of stuff and it's i feel like it's it's a very educational style documentary it's not right. really done to promote the movie all that much it feels like it's a here is the behind the scenes of what making music for film is like and we're using star wars because star wars is the big thing right now mm -hmm. um but yeah, it's it's going through everything and just the the narration of it by uh, Anthony Horder. Um, it's yeah, it's talking like the the education side of it, the economical factor of it, what it's like as a job to be. And it feels like to me, I never got to see this at school. This would have been way too cool. But it feels like almost like in a music class, if there was a substitute teacher who right. didn't really know what they were doing, like I don't know, maybe the gym teacher needed to step in and cover a music class. They could have just thrown this on and just let. Here's some music stuff, I guess. And it's it's like, here, kids, if you want to do music for movies, this is what it's like. Um, and that's that's kind of the feel for it. And I feel like that was a lot of documentaries that we got in this country around that time. <laughs> yeah. It's cool. It's it's good. Like yeah, I like it. I liked it. it. It's I, I don't know if I learned much from it, but no. just seeing just seeing the the production of Empire, like seeing new footage. Mm. Uh, behind the scenes of the making of one of my favorite movies ever mm. um is is a lot of fun uh the one thing that it, it wasn't something i learned from you obviously you watch it and you listen to enough of these scores like i've i've got the the empire strikes back final like the remaster that they did <laughs> last year um just there and it's as amazing like you and i are people who will listen to these scores without watching the movie and from that, you you can see the film in your head because we know it so well. We know where it matches right. up. But the 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 way that the the score will essentially edit for the film without them having to cut. So they mm -hmm. they they show this off by showing a lot of the stuff from the Death Star in uh, A New Hope, where right. it goes from shot to shot. It will cut between Luke and Leia, Han and Chewie, uh, Ben and Vader, and you know, that might all be in one motion where, yes, there is edits in the film, but the score will maintain throughout and it will just change yeah. and chop and change based on what we're seeing. And it's it's an art form. And it's it only works when you've got the right. collaboration between composer and the editor or the, the edit of the film, which is why the they, a lot of the time, composers are up against the clock so much because... It's Especially the last now, thing that gets the produced. Last thing. And it's so, the turnaround on Crucial. it can be so quick. And I feel like it's only sped up in the last like 10 years or so um, yeah. where they're doing visual effects up until the like, day of release. So yeah. a lot of the time they'll be scoring to temp, I, I assume. Yeah. Yeah. It's crazy. It's, it's crazy. The um, thing I love about John Williams scores too, and I've just, it might just because I've seen the movies mm. countless times is that they're fun to listen to like on vinyl and stuff. Yeah. You listen to them and while you're listening to them, you can start quoting the dialogue that mm -hmm. happens at certain moments. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that first, that first cue from star Wars as, as it goes into certain bits, I'll be like, holy start gross, reading. Dude. You, you start reading. The oh yeah. 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 You start reading the crawl like, to yourself. <laughs> right. Right. I think that's how I started talking to Gareth Edwards. I okay. brought that up. He did a, he did a, uh, he was doing an interview for like Star Wars show or something. And in that show, he talked about his, him and his friends quoting Star Wars. Mm. And he mentions he's always loved the rebellion mm. and he's always, he's always loved the original. And he, in that interview, he quoted that line, holding her as dangerous, the horde of this gets out. It could generate sympathy with the rebellion in the Senate. And I told him, I said, you know, when you said that in that interview, I was like, I love this guy. This guy's perfect yeah. for Star Wars because yeah. he's not, he's not 
just a guy who wears a Star Wars shirt and says, I like Star Wars. This is a guy who's watched Star Wars so many times that he's quoting the weirdest line. And an obscure (laughs) line like that. And it's like, well, there's a story behind that line. And there is. And that's the genius of like these movies and the writing of the movies is that there is depth, there's character, there's world building within Mm -hmm. a line like that. And then it takes someone like Gareth Edwards who wants to extrapolate and tell that story. Right. It's great. Right. The problem with that conversation was that he started to do the Obi-Wan and uh, uh, Han Solo meeting. Okay. Yep. Like he, he quoted that and then he would look at me. He had taken the Han Solo lines. Oh no. And was expecting me to call back the Obi-Wan lines. And I said, dude, I said, listen, I'm sure I know it, but yeah. I'm way on the spot. I was so afraid <laughs> that I was going to mess it up because he's so excited. I was like, I can't perform for you right now. I'm a few drinks in and I'm talking to someone who, um, I really admire before even being a part of star Wars made two movies that i really really like yeah and i was just like i said i can't do it and so he just just did the whole scene for me (laughs) and then talking about star wars and i was like i'm like this is much better because i i swear if i would have messed up a single sir alec guinness line i would have been so fucking embarrassed yeah um i probably could have pulled it off but i was like i was just like i can't on the spot like that yeah yeah completely um good dude I like him. He's a nice yeah. dude. Yeah. We should get him on. Uh, I'll see what I can do. I'll see what I can do. I should have <laughs> cool. got his I got his number. I, I didn't even think about it. I was having such a blast with you, him. Yeah. Um, yeah. You don't want to be that guy. We talked to astronauts that night. That's cool like, too. What party like, was you this? You guys this actually went to space. No, nah, nah, okay. A party. My, I lead a really weird life. A really weird life. Yeah. I live in this little apartment, but I've done things that are like I feel like were dreams. That yeah. was one of them. Um, so yes, let's get to business. What do you want to do first? Oh, but let's talk about next week. Let's talk about next episode or next week. Next week. We're gonna talk about next week. Okay, so next in week. eight days, yes. eight days, everybody knows that it's November 17th is life day. Mm-hmm. And we here at Live Action Star Wars have a special Life Day episode coming for you on Wednesday, November the 17th. So look forward to that. That'll be in one week. It'll be a bonus episode um, sort of outside our regular schedule. But speaking of schedules, from next Wednesday on, Live Action Star Wars will be released on Wednesdays instead of Tuesdays Mm -hmm. because we're getting so close to the Book of Boba Fett which will be streaming live, hopefully on Wednesdays. I think we could pull it off. I think we'll be able and to pull so it off. So I think from here on out, live action Star Wars will be coming at you every Wednesday. The, show, the show's on Disney Plus switch from Fridays to Wednesdays. We're switching from Tuesdays to Wednesdays. Ours is less dramatic. Yeah. <laughs> right. If you and can follow that, you can yeah. follow us. And those will be live. So go to yeah. either you can go to uh, go to live of action sw.com and yeah. that'll have links where you can get uh, we're streaming. So we have a Twitch channel, Facebook, YouTube. Um, I think we could stream to Twitter. I think I don't know. Possibly. I need that to feels like check. a thing. Yeah. Go to our go to live action SW. Follow us. That's our site. The times will be a little bit different all the time because different time zones and all of that and work schedules. But right. it'll be on Wednesdays. We yeah. will be making it work and hopefully because we're doing different times if it doesn't match up for you one week you'll be able to join us the next week something like that uh but yeah follow us on all the socials and everything and that is where you'll see when each episode when we're going to be streaming that live yes so in one week we'll be doing or in eight days we'll be releasing our life day holiday special special for live action star wars which leaves the following wednesday for james's pick that is, that is my pick, and this one is going to be one that we've teased in the past. Uh, we talked about it. When we talked about Star Tours, when we watched that okay. documentary, we saw the a snippet of what they called the Darth Vader Ballet. Oh, shit. So we are going to talk about the Darth Vader Ballet, as they called it. 
Uh, awesome. I have gone in and I have looked. It's not that long and it's not much of a Darth Vader ballet. So because it's only a 15 minute, 14 minute YouTube video. Oh, uh, I have also pulled. So we're going to do a little, a little three put, a little three thing. Uh, it's going to be all shows from Disney based around the Darth Vader ballet. So we're going to do the Star Tours ribbon cutting from 1987. <laughs> okay. We're going to do the Star Tours reopening. And okay. we are going to do uh, just a very short, because we want some Darth Vader ballet in there, uh, Dance Off with Star Wars Stars 2013 finale medley with Gangnam Style. Okay. Uh, and the reason all that we're doing... Those, all three of those will be at liveactionstarwars.com on our YouTube page. They will all be linked. Um, and the reason we're doing that, uh, we're going to have a guest on for that one. Um, okay. He was he was a recent contributor to Ralph's recap of No Time to Die. Um mm -hmm. I've mentioned him a couple of times on here. My friend Ed is going to come and join us because he wants to know all about the Darth Vader ballet. All right. I am excited. It's a weird one. It's a weird one. It. Let's get I a weird one weird in one. before the book of Boba Fett. Yeah. So it's Disney related. So yep. our, our sort of ramp up to book of Boba Fett where we watch, you know, Empire Mandalorian, this, this Empire documentary, mm -hmm. like we're in that sort of Empire era and Disney era of um, Boba Fett. Yeah. <laughs> I'm excited. I, I, I'm um, hoping and I'm sure that we will see Boba Fett also, dance at some point. It's going to be the easiest, easiest homework oh, yeah. to do before our next it's, episode. We're not watching a full film. 20, 20 minutes. <laughs> 20 minutes of three YouTube videos. You've got this. Everyone cool. can join us. And please let us know what you think. Because so, some of this stuff is ridiculous. Yeah. Look forward to that in two weeks and look forward to our life day special in one week. Um, yes. Yeah. And I think that's it. Visit liveactionstarwars.com. That takes us to our YouTube channel. Visit Star Wars uh, Live Action SW um, for our site to get all our where all our streaming shit is happening and yep. more info like that. And then, yeah, until next time, may the force be with you. Punch it. Her is dangerous. If word this gets out, it could generate sympathy for the rebellion in the Senate.